Hi, my name's Roger Hallam. Um, I've been asked to do a short input to your conference. Thanks very much for having me speak to you. As you may know, I'm a co-founder of Extinction Rebellion, Insulate Britain, Just Stop Oil. I spend most of my time over the last few years designing civil resistance campaigns on the climate around the Western world, um, mainly in the what's called the A22 network, uh, last generation in Germany, for instance, and what have you. And uh, many of these campaigns have become the biggest campaigns in their countries, getting 90% name recognition. And it's been pretty tough going, as I'm sure many of you know. Thousands of people have been to prison. Uh, hundreds of uh, thousands of people have been arrested. Uh, hundreds of people have gone to prison. I was um, sentenced to two years in prison uh, about a week ago. It was suspended. So that's why I'm able to speak to you today. So, yeah, it's been pretty tough and there is now, I suppose, a bit of a sea change on the strategy, the grand strategy, as you might say, of what the civil resistance climate movements are going to do over the next five to ten years. So if it's OK, I'm going to go through that. Hopefully that will you know, give you some ideas on what might be happening in the world that I move in. And um, so I've got 10 minutes, so I'll see what I can do. <laughs> all right, so as you all are aware, we're now, now going past 1.5 degrees of global warming. Uh, the possibility of that not happening is virtually zero. Um, according to uh, the top scientists, we're going to be speeding past two degrees at some point in the 2030s. And this means objectively that the system, the economic system and the political systems that have served us to varying degrees over the last 30, 40, 50 years are going to collapse. That's the strategic realisation. So it's not like the world is going to end in the sense that everyone's going to suddenly drop down and die. But there's a specific prediction, which is that the neoliberal regimes are not going to be able to adapt to what's going to come down the line. They're going to be seen as responsible, obviously, for the eternal catastrophe that is now uh, coming upon us. And there's lots of valid speculation on whether we are actually going to go extinct as a species or whether geoengineering and earth repair mechanisms are going to, um, you know, save us. And in my view, that's an open question. I'm not going to talk about that. But what I'm going to talk about is what the prospects are for civilization over the next 10 to 20 years, which is obviously a massive question, but it is the question of our time. So the realisation, I suppose, in the circles that I move in is, is number one, 1 1.5 is locked in. Number two, neoliberal regimes are going to collapse. And number three is the default will be some form of fascism. In other words, uh, something like Trump or worse. And this is going to um, happen unless we create mass popular progressive movements that fuse various different sub-strategies together into one main strategy, which is to take over the state and transform the state into a new democratic form. Um, so the idea here, I suppose, is that there are two main things that need to be done. The first one is to engage with the political system and inside the strategy which means standing in elections. This is what's happening in the UK, but standing in elections in a new way, uh, using assemblies to choose candidates and to choose programmes so that people feel heard and feel like they're participating and therefore own the campaign and therefore volunteer. So this is a paradigm shift in, in how we think about political parties and political processes. We don't set up a party, create a programme, uh, choose candidates and then go out to get uh, votes. We change the relationship around. And that produces independent MPs, uh, members of Congress, whatever. 
and it also more importantly leads to the creation of parallel institutions. In other words, historically, uh, when in revolutionary periods, a major determinant of progressive success is to have an institution that doesn't have constitutional power, but has um, popular power, as you might say, as the voice of the people. And then the other element of the strategy is to have street movements, that the street movements are not, are not uh, focused on one single issue, as in the neoliberal period, but they're they fuse all their issues into a critique of the system itself, which is probably the default orientation of the majority of the people in Western democracies at the present time. In other words, people are aware that the neoliberal strategy of having a single issue campaign, creating policy change, is not going to happen, or even if it does, it's not going to change the fundamentals, which are that the corporate class basically dominates our society and the political class is structurally committed to short-termism and therefore will not and cannot deal with the catastrophe that we face. Okay, so the idea is that these two things come together in a pincer movement in terms of a grand strategy. Obviously the details change from country to country and the particular historical moments um, change, right, from period to period. But if you look at the last 250 years of radical revolutionary history, there's a sort of sociology of revolution which points to this meta-strategy, which is a pincer movement between people in parliament, people in parallel institutions, and a street movement. So the parallel institution um, creates the legitimacy around a new fundamental programme of social and political transformation and that legitimises street movement and when the elites try to destroy the parallel institution, you know, the police go in and disrupt it and what have you, the street movement comes onto the street to create the political pressure to protect the parallel institution. In other words, the two things need each other. There's no point having a citizens' assembly without a street movement, and a street movement doesn't have the legitimacy that a citizens' assembly would give it. Note that the citizens' assembly is not created by the state, it's created by civil society as a uh, parallel institution, as a challenge to the existing system. So um, that's the external strategy. An internal strategy is the fundamental change here is we need to move away from classical horizontalism where there's no leadership structure and uh, people do what they want and coordination and strategic coherence are pro aren't able to be formed. We also knew, move away from the neoliberal model of having independent separate campaigns that don't coordinate, don't have a close ecological relationship. Uh, what we move towards is having a central leadership structures that create that strategy and then close ecological relationships between elements of the resistance, between the different, the different campaigns and the different inside and outside strategies, and that they basically take their orders, in inverted commas, in terms of top-level strategy from the central strategic team. In, that, in other words, when the moments of mass mobilisation will happen, where they'll be focused and what they'll do, those fundamental questions. Within that frame, then people have autonomy, obviously, to create their own, uh, their own particular uh, activities. So that's one thing. The other thing is, is that there needs to be a culture of service, trust, respect, which is absent from many sort of narcissistic sort of cultures within activism. And so the fundamental thing here is that there has to be mass mobilisation, so ordinary people get involved who are focused on the job and are used to following orders, as it were, and getting on with things and being practical and not ideological and actually want to see, you know, things happen. Okay, so, you know, all that sounds grand and you're probably thinking that's all up in the air nonsense. 
So I'll just finish, <laughs> or maybe you're not, <laughs> but I'll just finish uh, to say that, number one, you know, I'm not coming on this video to say, you know, this isn't going to happen. Myself and the teams I work with have a record of creating the biggest movements in the Western world. So we have some credibility. Secondly, what's your plan? What's the other plan? So the analogy here, which is a bit gruesome, but I think, you know, to speak the truth, this is the analogy we face, is we're in a concentration camp. By that, I don't mean I'm implying it's a concentration camp from any particular historical period. But usually the dilemma in the concentration camp, as everyone should know, is you play the rules of the game and you die in six months' time, or you try to escape and you're highly likely to get shot climbing over the fence. Which one do you go for? And what I'm suggesting is you have the revolutionary path and we try and get over the fence rather than trying to play a game that's going to lead to our extermination. And in case you think that's dramatic, all I'm saying is what the UN guy said like two or three days ago, we've got two years to save the world. And he said he wasn't being melodramatic. And the last thing I'll finish on is, look, you know, I'm talking to you. You're hearing me. The agency is in the here and now. And it's what you do over the next week, over the month that counts. So don't, you know, get distracted by big discussions about what needs to happen and what doesn't need to happen. What happens is what you do as an individual. And one pathway is to look up on the internet or to contact me. Uh, I'm part of an organisation called Revolution in the 21st Century and it's trying to promote this new zeitgeist. It's not a frontline organisation but it's trying to create the facilities, training, education, inspiration for mainly young people around the Western world to get a grip of their destiny and go out and do the business. All right, that's it. Thanks very much.